This is QTV News. I am Antoine Esonyasi and thanks for joining us. Coming up, food safety is important to every country. A workshop jointly hosted by the FSQA and some of its partners profiled some of the risks associated with the food production sector. As the school's football competition, Principal's Cup, reaches its climax, Gambia High has the possibility of pulling off a double win its male and female teams have made it to their respective finals. And a look at arrow roots cultivation. For more on these and other stories coming up, stay tuned. Gambia's Food Safety and Quality Authority, in partnership with the Food and Agricultural Organization, funded by the European Union, has set out to profile and rank the risk associated with livestock production and agriculture, among other matters. Mam Jara ECC tells us more. Agriculture has an important aspect in every developing country, and uh, the sector offers opportunities for comprehensive growth, providing they are comprehensive food safety policies which can aid poverty reduction. Food Quality and Safety Authority, FQSA, jointly organized workshops on profiling risk associated with food production looked at specific sectors, especially with industries, crops, and in livestock production. The workshop hopes to develop comprehensive data and background information about the potential risk to crops such as granite, which can be affected by aflatoxins, and which eventually stop the Gambia from exporting granites to many countries. Another example of a food hazard is salmonella, which is found in poultry eggs and is hazardous to the health of an individual when consumed. The workshop mapped out many more potential risks that need to be identified and combated. Dr. Andres Kiamaya of the Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO, highlighted the ways to identify the risk in food and crops. About how to best assess the risks, identify those risks in the first place, and uh, then consider some of the management options that are available to them to make food safer for the general population, but also ensure that uh, export opportunities are taken care of. He further talks about the ways to prevent diseases in crops, livestock and many more. The first thing would be that participants undertake a literature search. So they need to find from the international literature whether those hazards have been identified, what type of levels are typical in those products, because just because a hazard is present in a food product doesn't mean that it will make you ill. There's a potential it will. And we need to try and control the levels to such a degree that illness rates are as low as they can possibly be. Uh, they will also, uh, as part of the next workshop, will learn more about undertaking targeted surveillance. So going out into the community, collecting samples and testing them for the hazards that we think might occur. Daryl Sexton, EU representative, expressed his concern about Gambia's food production based on our crops and livestock. Well, we have in the past imported foods from, from the Gambia. Um, so we have food quality standards in the European Union. If with exports, as in the case of groundnuts, we identify a, um, um, a food safety issue, uh, such as aflatoxin, we issue rapid alerts. And in the recent past, we've issued a number of rapid alerts on ground nuts being um, exported to the European Union. And in fact, it has led to the slow cessation of exports from the Gambia because aflatoxin is a big issue here. Abdullah Jalo, a participant and a scientist in food safety, spoke of the effectiveness of the training and how useful it will be to him and to his organization. Principally, I'm employed to do exactly what we are learning here, thus outlining the hazards we have in our food chain, but also simplifying it so that policymakers can understand the risks involved, but also how to mitigate these risks. That's exactly what risk profiling means. So it's giving me more knowledge of how to show policymakers the risks involved you know, that's in our food chain and how to solve that, those problems. So it's making my work actually much more easier. The Food and Safety and Quality Authority in the Gambia was established by an act parliament in 2011 to promote the safe consumption of food and to prevent crops and livestock that are under the attack from pests and diseases which can affect productivity and quality. Reporting for QTV News, I am Mam Yara Sise. 
Aro roots are one of the local tubers in the Gambia. Although mostly imported, Gambian women are involved in its cultivation. They go through hard labor with primitive means of cultivation to get the tuber in our markets. Maud Lamin Choi visited the farmers to have first-hand information of what it takes to get arrow root to the Gambian market. Loved by many Gambians, arrow root is among the least cultivated tubers in the country. Apart from local common tubers in the Gambia, arrow root can also be found in the local market. It is also locally and commonly called jabere in the Gambia. Some farmers in the Central River region of the country, who are mostly women, cultivate this tuba every year after the first rainfall. However, most arrow root consumers are likely to lack the know-how about its cultivation process in the Gambia. Cultivating arrow root is certainly a source of income for these farmers. Despite the hard labor involved in its cultivation, these women wouldn't give up on harvesting it to regularly supply the local market. Halima has been cultivating arrow root for a decade in her struggle to feed her family. Although she is aging, she joins young women in the laborious practice of arrow root cultivation. Cultivating arrow root is a laborious work to do. As you can see, my hands and my entire body are paining me. The work involves only manpower. We bend our backs a lot in doing this farming, and when I go to bed, I always feel dizzy. Primitive in their farming practices, they track or mount donkey carts to fetch plant leaves for mulching. By spreading leaves on the already cultivated land, they are able to conserve the soil's moisture content, control weeds, and improve the quality of the tuber. The leaves are then removed and organic manure added to the soil. Climate change is affecting farmers in this part of the region, but mulching through the use of dry leaves is a wise practice to these farmers. It is only when we use these dry leaves for mulching that we can have a good harvest. We once tried to cultivate arrow roots without the leaves, but we ended up having a low harvest. Arrow root is harvested at the end of groundnut season, and these women produce bags of it, thereby getting money for food and shelter for themselves. Mohamed Lamin Choi for QTV News. Meanwhile, First Lady Fatumata Barrow on Friday presided over the handing over ceremony of more than 150 beds and hospital equipment to the Edward Francis Small Teaching Hospital in Banjul. QTV's Malik Nyang reports. The First Lady's Foundation, with the support of EGALIS, a France-based philanthropic organization, on Friday handed over 150 beds and other medical equipment to the Edward Francis Small Teaching Hospital. The event was attended by the First Lady Fatumata Barbaro, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Momodu Tangara, representatives of EGALIS, hospital staff, and partners of the First Lady's Foundation. Established in 1959, the EFSDH is the country's main referral hospital with a total of 600 beds. However, the hospital continues to grapple with challenges ranging from insufficient beds to drugs, amongst others. It is therefore hoped that the donation of these beds and hospital equipment will help address some of these challenges. Addressing the gathering, the Deputy Permanent Secretary at the Ministry of Health, Daura Sise, said the First Ladies Foundation has made a series of interventions in the health sector and continues to support the hospital, especially in specialized health care. Fatmata Barbaro Foundation is playing in the transformation of this very important hospital, which is Edward Francis Small Teaching Hospital. This is very important and noble because as a ministry, this is one of the apex hospitals when it comes to specialized health care delivery in this country. Speaking through a translator, Dr. Saik Tevenot of Egalis said his organization has been offering support to Gambians in education and agriculture for the past 15 years. He also expressed delight at partnering with the First Ladies Foundation to support the country's health sector. Meanwhile, Betty Sen, Senior Communications Officer of the First Ladies Foundation, highlighted some of the projects being carried out by the foundation and a sort of their resolve to support the health sector. 
FAB has done a tremendous work towards the health and well-being of the Gambian people. FAB a fait un, 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 un travail important dans le but d'aider le la bien présence et la santé de des gens. Especially women, particulièrement des femmes, children, des enfants, and the underprivileged. Et les gens qui, sont, qui ne sont pas privilégiés. I would also take the time Je saisis l'occasion to thank Association Egalise from France de remercier et de féliciter l'Association Egalise de France for this noble gesture pour ce, euh, cet honorable geste which will highly contribute to our health sector needs. For the speakers, including the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Dr. Mamadou Tangara, the Chief Nursing Officer at EFSTH, Horeja Sen, highlighted the importance of the impact the donation will have in addressing the hospital's challenges. At the end of the event, the First Lady took Egalese officials on a tour of the hospital to give them first-hand information and to observe the sections of the hospital that need the most urgent attention. Reporting for QTV News, I am Malik Nyang. The Nova Scotia Gambia Association held a graduation ceremony for trainees who completed a two-week summer school training on promotion of health and education. The program trained 100 peer health educators from various schools to develop their knowledge on health and education. Malik Nyang attended the program and Hina reports. Through the support of the Ministry of Basic and Secondary Education and Ministry of Health, the Nova Scotia Gambia Association completed the two-week summer school training aimed at enhancing students' perspectives on health and education. Ahmad Biba, who chaired the event, said the NSGA has advocated the promotion of health and education for over three decades and has achieved unprecedented success in trying to mold young people to be better citizens. In this light, the students selected under their peer health organizations in their various schools were trained and sensitized the guest speaker of the ceremony, Babakar Juf, enlightened trainees on the importance of their training and urged them to utilize the training to make a better country. Take this challenge seriously. Take back the messages you have been given. Take back the attitudinal change that you have seen here from your mentors, from your teachers, from the coordinators. Go back and teach, impart this kind of knowledge, impart this behavioral change, impart this attitudinal change so that our society becomes a better place to live. He went on to say that the NSGA has played a significant role in educating young people about health and health issues around them. The NSGA project coordinator, Babukar A.I. Jalo, complimented the discipline shown by the students and advised them to keep it up, saying there is no use for education if discipline is lacking. Nothing can take place in the absence of discipline, and I have seen Discipline in the eyes of these people. I've seen discipline within these two weeks. I will not do justice without thanking you enough because education without discipline is a, meaning, is, is a meaningless education. So the summer school not only trained students on education and health related issues, but also developed their skills in public speaking, quizzes, drama, poetry, and many more. A Gambia senior secondary school student and a trainee, Adam Mboch, who won the best poet accolade during the summer school training said how he became a poet and recited a poem titled The Truth is Everlasting, which thrilled audience and earned him great applause. I can say what inspired me to be a poet is because it's my passion. It's what I love doing. And it is said that make your passion your profession. Whatever you love doing, you try to make sure that you achieve it as much as possible. It is time to pick up the mic and speak your mind. It is time to move to the straight path and be so kind. It is time to pick up our pens and write. It is time to be given the platform to decide. It is time to be given the chance to express our views and sentiments. It is time to prove our capabilities and intelligence. It is time to appoint educated people for not through ethnicity, but competence. For the truth is everlasting. Students were also lectured on various courses and prizes were awarded to the most outstanding students in various categories. At the end of the ceremony, facilitators were presented with certificates in appreciation of their work in ensuring the objectives of the summer school 2019 were met. Malik Nyang for QTV News. And we now take a short commercial break and the news continues when we return.
Light. From the beginning of time, light has been there. It is integral to our survival and to our way of living. We need light to work. To build. To grow things and even to see our loved ones. Light makes things easier and better. So QCell has changed the way you buy QPower to make it easier and more accessible. You can now access the same service quickly and get your cash power tokens instantly with the new QCell QPower code. To light up your world, simply dial star 363 hash. With a touch of your fingers, with ease and convenience from the comfort of your home or office, you can bring light into your world instantly with star 363 hash. Q Power, lighting your world. Q Cell Sunyabus. We, we innovate, innovate, others, others follow. follow. Welcome back. And if you're just joining us, this is QTV News. Gambian pilgrims visit and offer prayers at Mount Uhud. This is the place where Hamza, the Lion of Allah, and all the Muslims died during the Battle of Uhud. QTV's Babakar Sise is in Medina and he now reports. Uhud is a mountain north of Medina and is 1077 meters high. The Battle of Uhud was fought in 625 CE between Muslims and non-believers. It occurred between a force from the Muslim community of Medina, led by the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and a force led by Abu Sufyan from Makkah. At the battlefield, whilst heavily outnumbered, the Muslims gained the upper hand and forced the enemy lines back. When the battle looked to be only one step far from a decisive Muslim victory, a serious mistake was committed by a part of the Muslim army which sifted the outcome of the battle. A breach of Muhammad's order by the Muslim archers who left their assigned post to loot the enemy camp allowed a surprise attack from the Makan cavalry led by a war veteran, Khalid ibn Walid. Many Muslims were killed, including Hamza, the Prophet's uncle and foster brother. Muhammad, the messenger of Allah, got injured. The Muslims had to withdraw up the slopes of Uhud and Khalid ibn Walid's men marched back to Mecca, declaring victory. The dead from the Muslim camp are buried here and every year pilgrims from all over the world come here to offer prayers to them. May their souls rest in Jannah. Babukar Sise QTV News, Madina Tulmunawara. The 2019 school football competition known as the Principals' Cup is about to reach its climax at the Independence Stadium in Bacau, with finals in both boys' and girls' categories set for Sunday, 4th August. Gambia Senior Secondary School have the distinction of being able to contest both categories, locking horns with Batrop in the female category and with Nasir in the male category. Babu Karsi has the roundup of the semifinals played on Friday. Sixteen schools began the competition with the hope of reaching the finals to at least go home with something. At the end of the day, three schools have come out on top and will entertain the crowds on Sunday. In what I expected to be a scintillating encounter in board finals, Gambia High facing opponents in board finals. In Friday's simultaneous semis, played at 3 p.m. in the female category. The two strongest sides, Botrop Senior Secondary School and defending champions Gambia Senior Secondary School, made it through with comfortable score lines. At the main ball of the stadium, Botrop proved too strong for St. Michael, putting five goals past them in a one-sided game that many predicted even before kickoff. At the other ground of the stadium, Gambia High also had it easy against Mahat Senior, scoring three goals past them to set a date with arch rivals Botrop for tomorrow's final. Botrop is coached by Fakeba Sen, who promises a sock for Gambia High come Sunday's final. Uh, the preparation was so much hard on us at the initial stage. Sometimes it's difficult to have all players on board, but thank God after the division, we managed to have all these players on board and we train and we prepare very well for this competition. And this is the best year I feel we have for this year, Principal's Cup. In the other semi-final in the male category, played at 5 p.m., Gambia High again made it through to the finals after narrowly edging past Kabafita 5-3 on penalties. 
After a nail biting and goalless 90 minutes, Gambia High are the only school in this year's championship to have both male and female sides playing in the finals. In the other semi final, Nasir, for the first time in history of the Principal's Cup, will march into the finals after overcoming Mindau by a goal to nil. For the Mane is the young coach guiding Nasir and shared his joy with us on getting to the final. Since day one, we prepared well. We played against Kabafita, we played against Amitage, we played against Tahir, and we played against uh, Mingdao today, the semi final. And I think all our preparations are the same. We do best of all that we can do, go in for free ups because we know we cannot train because it's a phys physical training, it's a physical tournament. Because you play today, tomorrow you play. Uh, I think it's only tomorrow that we can even have free day to train. So for that being the reason, we will make best use of our tomorrow free time and capitalize, train on our poor places, our poor positions to make best use of them and comes against uh, these people that is Gambia High. Gambia High coach Seku Sane was disappointed at not winning inside the 90 minutes, but nevertheless promised a better performance in the finals. It was a big surprise for me winning on penalties because that was not our ambition, you know. We came with a game plan to win on the game and we win on penalties. It's a big surprise for me today. It is the same preparation from day one as in the qualifier and we prepare very well to date and we'll do the same preparation for the finals on Sunday, inshallah. The winners in both categories will pocket $75,000 with other prizes up for grabs include best player, leading goal scorer and the best goalkeeper. The competition is also an avenue for the junior national team coaches to identify talents for the under-17 and under-20 sides respectively. Babu Karsi, QTV News. Before we end this bulletin of the news, let's take a quick look at our main stories. Gambia's Food Safety and Quality Authority, in partnership with the Food and Agriculture Organization, funded by the European Union, has set out to profile and rank the risk associated with livestock production and agriculture, among other matters. First Lady Fatoumata Bah Barrow on Friday presided over the handing over ceremony of more than 150 beds and hospital equipment to the Edward Francis Small Teaching Hospital in Banjul. And Gambian pilgrims visit and offer prayers at Mount Uhud. This is the place where Hamza, the Lion of Allah and other Muslims died during the Battle of Uhud. And that's all we have for you in this edition of the news. Join us tomorrow for more news. Until then, thanks for watching.